Thank you for joining this topic on real-time interactive visualization with Splunk infrastructure monitoring. My name is Janelle Shaw. I'm a staff sales engineer with Splunk and I'm focused on our observability solutions. And today we'll take a look at real-time interactive visualization. It's really gonna be an overview of pre-built out-of-the-box dashboards that we have for hundreds of integrations. And then I'm going to walk through how to create charts and dashboards from scratch and use in-stream analytics functions as well as then how to share your newly created dashboards. So we'll look at that in the demo. Now, what is the need here? Well, the need is how can you visualize the state of your infrastructure using metrics in charts and dashboards so that you can have the most efficient and effective analysis. And so the need is typically leverage pre-built content, but also you often find a reason to, to customize a view specific to the aspects of your environment. And the goal is to minimize moving between different tabs, moving between, you know, that swivel chair is kind of the buzz, buzz terminology now, but it's to minimize the context switching. We wanna have uh, that combined view that surfaces just the information that you care about. And then once you achieve that goal, being able to reuse and share that content and that's what we'll look at using Splunk infrastructure monitoring. So in the back end, we have this patented streaming analytics architecture, and you're going to see that surface in the demo today as we use pre-built content, so out of the box views, as well as build new charts and dashboards. And you'll see as we apply the in-stream analytics functions, you'll see the data changing live on the screen. And then I'll show you how you can reuse and share those. So in the demo, I will walk you through using Splunk infrastructure monitoring, using the built-in content to get started, and then how you can design and customize the charts and dashboards to exactly your specifications. So let's take a look in the product. So here we are in the solution itself. We're focused on Splunk infrastructure monitoring, and logically there is an infrastructure grouping. This is the infrastructure navigator. This is designed to give you a view of all of your key inventory across your data center, as well as your cloud providers. And it is a read-only style view, and it's designed within this heat map style. So no matter whether you're looking at EC2s or Azure VMs, or you're looking at vSphere hosts, you'll see um, really the telemetry for the resources like CPU, memory, disk, and so forth, depending, you know, it varies a little bit depending on what that target is. Now I'm pointing this out, this is read only because I wanted to include this in the pre-built content because it's a phenomenal way without building a dashboard to be able to say, hey, I wanna group and see, maybe I wanna look at this by instance type, or maybe I only care about these, you know, T2 systems. And so you can filter and group and use this on the fly to come up with the view that you care about. So this is one way to be able to use pre-built content without customizing anything. Now, each of these um, charts you see, they operate the same no matter where you find them within the UI. So if we look at say, um, let's look at like CPU utilization, for instance, you'll be able to see the inputs for this chart right here. And this is showing that in this case, we're filtered to EC2 CPU utilization. You can see it's actually using this as an input and then applying different effects to the signal. And this is showing min, you see the percentiles, max, and each of these designate whether or not that is something that you would like graphed or plotted on the chart itself. So it's very easy to also apply filters here. So if there was something we wanted to filter further, you can do that from here. The functions that you're applying are simply from this drop down. So you might choose to do tallies and counts or means, percentiles, weighting moving average. Maybe a time shift is appropriate if you're trying to see today at this moment in time compared to maybe last week and you want to visually overlay and, and verify if there's differences in the patterns or the trends. You see top, bottom, max, min, standard deviation calculations. You can verify delta or even the rate of change. So you can do the difference between current value versus previous, or you can also factor in the time interval. You'll see a number of mathematical calculations here, like square root. So all of that is simply choosing from this drop down menu. Maybe you want to tally something. Um, I'll just do average just as an example here. And this is a great way to be able to apply that function right here in the UI. Behind the scenes, 
when you click on view signal flow, this is our Python like language. It's called signal flow. It's actually a very powerful language behind the scenes that drives all sorts of really a statistical computation engine, but it's pretty straightforward now that you saw the UI, right? You have your data input. And then you have maybe um, a function of some sort, right? An analytics function that you might be applying and whether or not to display that, you know, chart that on, uh, plot that on the chart. Down here again, you see the additional rows. So we're just doing additional calculations. This is critical if you want to advance to monitoring as code. So anything that you want to also be able to manage as code in your infrastructure, you can do that here with your monitoring. This actually becomes program text um, within the resource definition if you want to use Terraform. So there could be a whole nother tech talk on just that topic, but we have uh, getting started guides around that. So you could use Terraform to create this chart. And this would of course be that definition of, for the data, the signal inputs itself. It's just as easy to undo this as well. Now, if we want to add additional data, you could start to type and maybe I want to search for memory this time, or maybe I want to search for non EC2 data, whatever that might be. If you know the metric name, this is a great way to be able to search here. And I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to use memory use. So that's one way to get data in. Another way would be if you wanted to um, actually browse and use the metric finder over here. So you can choose from different integrations, or maybe you have a vSphere environment. So you have vSphere metrics, and you want to find the metric that way. So this is another way. Maybe I'll do CPU for vSphere. And now you can add a plot that way. So these could be used in a number of different ways, but it's that simple to be able to find the metrics that you'd like to add in. And again, when you're looking at that type of data, then you're going to have different. So vSphere would have different dimensions and filters potentially available for it, like a vCenter applies to vSphere, right? An ESX host applies to vSphere. So you could use that to be able to filter whether you select individually or you want to do some sort of a wildcard, maybe you want to do apps to wildcard. So you can be very flexible on the filters to define exactly the signal inputs and exactly the, the style that you'd like. It's just as easy to be able to delete those you also saw the clone come up here. So if I wanted to clone and copy that previous line, and now I want to do maybe the you know P90 here and P95 here. So very flexible interface to work within. Go ahead and close this. Go ahead and close this out. Now it's not changing anything because this is read only. And this is a great starting point to get a sense of, hey, Maybe I want to count um, EC2 active host. So that's something I care about on my dashboard. I'm going to copy that. And when you copy that, it puts it up here in the clipboard. You notice the other things that you can do, you can share, you can download charts as images. So there's a lot of different ways that you can share the information right from here. So maybe I want to count active hosts and maybe I do want that CPU utilization for my EC2. So I'm going to add that to the clipboard as well. Now let's go into the dashboard grouping itself. So it's here on the menu under dashboards and here under built-in dashboard groups, this is your pre-built content. As data is received into the platform, a dashboard group will appear for that data type. So by default, you'll start with just sample data. Um, you'll start to see organization metrics, that sort of thing, but you won't have all these other groups. And this is only a fraction of the couple hundred integrations that we support out of the box. But notice here combined, because we're receiving vSphere data, we have vSphere group, and these are individual dashboards within that group. So if I found that I wanted to analyze ESX hosts a lot, you could actually tag that as a favorite, and now that puts it up here so you don't have to search in the built-in group. Maybe I also want to look for things that are like we're just looking at EC2 data. So that could be from CloudWatch, or that could be sent from an agent running on the host. So maybe I also want to look at EC2 data or Apache data. So you can create your favorites list right from here. And then you can drill into any of those to see the dashboard itself. Now, once we're in the dashboard, this is again, pre-built. So this is a read-only view. So we can use and continue on like we were, maybe I want to copy this, add that to the clipboard as well. And maybe I want to do, um, I don't know, CPU utilization for that one as well, just to keep on that same trend. So we're adding all those to the clipboard up here. The other thing we might want to do, though, and this is a great starting point, too, is this dashboard might have many charts on it. 
that are really helpful to your team and you want to combine and modify it. But again, since it's read only because it's pre pre built, what could you do? Well, up here at the top right, you have two options. You could make a complete copy of it. And that's what save as does. This is copying as it is right now. And then any changes you make to that copy are your own. They have no relation back here. You could also create a mirror and a mirror is a way to make changes to the original. And then those changes can be reflected no matter where that dashboard gets, gets mirrored out to. So it's a great way if you have a team that maybe wants to centrally manage or create a dashboard for the team, but then you want the individual users to be able to set certain controls and filters themselves. So a mirror is another option for that as well. What I'm going to do is I am going to do a save as, and instead of ESX hosts, I'm going to change this and I will call this uh, Tech Talk Group. Um, actually, this is Tech Talk Dashboard. So I'll call it View. And I'm going to create, or I'll add it into, if I don't have one, I'll create a group called Tech Talk. And then go ahead and you notice here you have permission control. So this is whether I want my users to be able to modify that copy that I'm creating here as well. I'm going to leave it as anyone can edit it. And when I save it, now we are in the Tech Talk group. So we're no longer in the vSphere group. We're in the Tech Talk view. That's the dashboard that I saved as. And now it's a complete copy. Now, I don't care about all of these. So I may go through and actually delete these, right? So I was saying I don't want to see everything. Maybe I just want um, CPU for a couple of these things. So I'm going to delete that one and I'll do this guy too. I'll leave that one. Now you can modify and change around these orders. So it's very easy to be able to design and adjust the layout. If I slide this over here, maybe I'll uh, grab this one, put it up here in the center. And now up here at the top on that menu, we can paste the charts in from before. Now, if I didn't have the placeholder, I could use this dashboard and this link here that says dashboard with four copy that could create a brand new dashboard with whatever is in the clipboard. So you have a couple different ways that you can do that. I'm going to paste them here since I already have a placeholder where I want to paste those. And you notice, remember, I was copying and adding multiple. So that's why we have some duplicates. So I don't need all of these. I'll just go ahead and delete that out. So it doesn't, so we don't have duplicate data on here, even though it's just a demo. <laughs> so there we go. So there's our there's our dashboard. That's our starting point. That is our complete copy. Now, what else could we do from here? Well, maybe we want to, and you can actually copy it and paste it on the same chart. So maybe I want to copy it and I'll paste it again right here. So I might use the same chart, but we wanted to maybe change the visualization. So over here, I have my CPU. I'm going to shrink that down. So I have my CPU. And then maybe this one, we want to change the visualization. We want to use some of those different analytics functions. So I'm going to go ahead and click into that. And I'm using this one as an example also because I want to show you, you can change the style of the chart right from here. So we're lines, might be area charts, histograms. So we have a lot of ways that we can visualize that same data. Single value, if it made sense, we were actually calculating just a single value. A heat map would be another one. It's not easy to create a heat map. And of course, this is just simply showing, right? Higher values, a lot, a lot, not a lot of variance here in this particular one. But it's a great way to be able to show a different visualization here. The other thing you can do, you can see chart options. So if you wanted to go through and actually, um, for a heat map, it doesn't make sense, but if it were maybe a line chart, you'll be able to overlay different things on the legend or put high watermarks, that sort of thing. So a lot of flexibility here. I'm going to take our max off of here so we can see it better. So see how that's changing on the fly? If I come back out to my chart options and to my plot editor, but it's you're seeing that streaming analytics platform, that, that back end, that's what you're seeing here. This is a 10 second refresh right here. So we're looking at the last 15 minutes, but it's updating every 10 seconds. So again, great way to be able to to play around and manipulate the way the data is plotted on the chart. The other thing you'll notice, so I'm going to go ahead and save and close that. So I just adjusted. This one was not total different visualization just because of the type of data that it is, but I changed the scale. Let me see a little bit different there. 
Now, the other thing that you'll notice is that there are overrides, filters that you can apply to this dashboard. vCenter makes sense, obviously, for ESX hosts, doesn't make sense for EC2 hosts. So maybe I'll actually change this to active EC2 hosts, and that way it's very clear. All right. Um, how would we modify those filters at the top? Well, that is under your dashboard variables. And vSphere can apply to only the plots that contain the vCenter. Uh, I'm sorry, it's vCenter. Uh, only the plots that contain vCenter. So it doesn't have to apply to all the charts. And this is a great way to be able to have multiple filters here. The other thing you can do is maybe you want to add in for some of the other data, maybe you want to add another property there. So maybe data center applies or maybe region applies or whatever those other properties might be that are unique to your environment. And you can have a default value or not, it does not have to be required. And again, it can apply to every chart or only those that have a data center property available. So now we have these two and when you click save and close, you'll see now we have a second value set here. So you can choose whether or not to use that data center um, filter or, or not. So this is a great way if you want to prompt a user or you want to pre-configure this. So you have one dashboard and they can choose prod versus pre-prod, staging versus UAT. That's a, a great option for filters. We don't even have to set it directly here though as a variable override. You can use this filter and this will expose what's available as well. So you could let the user choose from any and then they would find the same right data center and be able to see the different data center options and filter this way. So you don't have to pre-populate with this override. You could do it using the filter. But when we do it this way, this is a great option because you can save it and have it pre-configured for your users. Now, some other things that you might want to include on a dashboard, maybe something like um, a note. So if I say add a text note, and I'm just going to say this is the text. And you notice this is markup language, right? The editor right here, and I'll just save and close it. This is a great way to be able to add a description to your dashboard. So if this is something that other users are not familiar with, or you want to give instructions to the users, again, we can navigate and drag this back and forth. I have them all the same height, but you can adjust the height as well. But I think this is a great way, especially as you share your newly created dashboard, maybe you want to give instructions to your user and it says, if that chart labeled number of VSX hosts goes below three, do this. And you can put a link to your JIRA system or a link to the Confluence article or whatever it is that you want the user to do. So text can be a great option as well. The other thing that is helpful is to use events. So if we browse over here, let's actually put it up here. We want to do an event feed. Then I'm going to browse over here on the right. There may be events that you want to include in a rolling event feed. So whatever those events might be, you can pick and choose. You can, you can show all events, or you can say, I only want to show the ones maybe, and I labeled it with Janelle just to make it nice and easy to find, but maybe the only ones that are prepended with you know, production or infrastructure or a deployment or a rollback. So you could have, again, using your swim lanes, you could have many different types of events that you would like to include. And then when you do that, again, I'll just put up here, it's an event that is now going to add the bottom here, now we have an event feed. So if I send events into the system, we will be able to see events populate here for that Janelle infrastructure. I'm gonna move this up and then I think I will move this over. Oh, look at that, see? Right on cue, I had an event pop up for Janelle. So there you go. That's how easy it is. So imagine getting a feed from you know your like your Jenkins from your build automation or from some sort of other automation within your environment um, that can populate right from here. The other thing you can do is overlay it on the charts themselves. So an event overlay, I'm going to use that same type of an event and say show events. And when I do that, it brings I had it clicked. So you could see that's the event. So if you didn't have it as a as a um, element, as a chart type, you could just show the event feed on the right too. That's another way to do it. But what it does when you're doing, when you add it as an event overlay, it actually annotates on top of the charts within this view. So this is another great way, especially in the active triage, right? If I see a spike, 
or maybe there's an event of some sort, this is going to add context. This is a breadcrumb to tell me some something else that might be happening in the environment. So an infrastructure upgrade, maybe we you know, made a major configuration change, maybe we launched a new application or whatever that major event might be, whether you decorated just by you know, a script through the API or you're using integration into any of our other Splunk products or partners, this is a great way to be able to see the events that are relevant in the context of triage. So that is a, an excellent option as well. Last thing to mention. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and save. So whatever variables and everything I set, I save right here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a mirror to this. And I'm going to put it in, I'll put it in the JSHAW group. This is going to be mirror. And I'll go ahead and save. Okay. Now I'm going to open a second tab here. And in that second tab, let's open up that dashboard that I was just, oops, there it is already. Tech Talk view mirror, we have that one there. And then if I go back out to the other one we were just using, which is in our Tech Talk group, there's our Tech Talk view. So that one is a mirror. And the mirror means if I go ahead and I'll just delete one of these and delete this. Okay, so that is gone. The mirror will reflect that change momentarily as well. So that is a great option. You notice that I did a refresh and now that is gone. So a mirror is a great way to have that original and be able to make changes there. And um, not force individual users to have to, to manage their, their, uh, their copies directly. So they can still control things like this Maybe I want to not have the event overlay in this view. So the mirror does not have the event overlay. Come back out here. You notice even if I re reload this, this is the original. The original does have the event overlay. So you can have some individual localized settings, but the mirror again is a way to control that overall original. And just provides you a lot of flexibility. Do you wanna have copies or do you wanna have a uh, shared sort of linked linked views that the team just has control over certain settings. A lot of flexibility here. And so I hope you found this useful. Again, simply log in, use your dashboards to get started, use the out of the box groups. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. I have some additional resources I'd like to mention for you now though. Thanks for joining me in this topic. Here are some additional resources that you may find useful in your Splunk journey. There's a link to free training for signal effects fundamental series, walk through a lot of those concepts. The documentation is always a great resource and there are topics around charts and dashboards. So if you still have questions on copying versus mirroring, that's a great place to start. And there's a great blog post by Dave McAllister, who is one of our resident experts and evangelists. And he talks about this exact topic, which is using signal flow. He talks about the different types of mathematical functions that you can use within Splunk infrastructure monitoring. So it's definitely worth a short read and you have the link to that blog here. Thank you.